Hello everybody, glad you could make it. My name is Kayleigh Allen and welcome to another Repot with me. Except, of course, as like many recently, this isn't really a Repot with me. This is more like a cut stuff off an import with me. Now then, my last Repot with me, if you remember or you've seen it or you've seen the thumbnail of it or anything, you will know that I was working on this big ass bucket. Let me grab it. This big ass bucket of basically crystallinum and magnificum. If you also so watch my video, you'll know that I went on holiday for two weeks. Basically, I didn't get all the work done before I went away. And quite honestly, these plants have just decided to grow anyway. I don't know if you can see that out the front there. Yeah, those are the roots. It's not really focusing on them, but you get the idea. Yeah, they're just growing anyway. So we will see how they are. Hopefully there is no rot, but we're dealing with an import that just should have been done so long ago. And I just have not had the time. So without further ado, let's get started. As usual, I have some questions. I don't think today's video is going to be quite as long. I am actually on a very tight schedule and I'm still not going to get through all these today. So don't you just love it? I guess I could start with how my holiday was. It was very good. A lot of you might be slightly angry with me, but it was a good holiday because I got a lot of work done. I know I shouldn't be working. I really shouldn't. A holiday is a holiday, but honestly, it kind of wasn't a holiday and I've got a lot to do. So yeah, I, I didn't do a ton of work. Sorry, I'm just wondering where I'm going to put all this. I could just put a mound of shit down here, couldn't I? I don't really have anywhere to drop it. So I'm going to drop the obvious bits in a pile actually. So I might be dropping that off frame. That's got good root. That's a, wow. Okay. So in my absence, I, I will crack on with what I was saying before. In my absence, this plant has grown really well. Look at that. I can't get any closer because the camera's actually quite far away. That's not a bad amount of root. And you can see it's all totally new. I'm very, very happy with that. That's grown beautifully. That's quite nice. So there's one crystalline in there that is basically ready to pot up go into water for maybe a day. It, it doesn't need to. That's just me being lazy and then pulling them up. So that's quite nice. Yes. So my holiday was pretty good. I did get a lot done. Um, I've been planning a lot of content, to be honest, <laughs> a lot of content for, you know, the next couple of months. I thought, you know, this is my one opportunity to get a head start. Again, I know that's not really a holiday. I did relax on holiday, guys. Okay. I, I did. I did. I did some sunbathing. I didn't even tell. I've got a really nice bronze glow, but I did do some work. Um, and it was, some of it was business stuff, some of it was, you know, for the channel and stuff like that. Um, oh, this one's like really dry. Oh my God. Hang on. Like really dry, like dusty levels of dry. So yeah, my holiday was good. I was very keen to come back and basically start work on my content. So the next couple of months I'll be working pretty hard, but I'm, I'm kind of pumped for it. I'm kind of excited for it. I've got loads of good videos lined up for you guys. Trust me. You're going to have to wait a little while, but I promise you I've got some good stuff coming. Really, really excited for it. So that's that. What else have people asked me about? Um, a few people have said, how is riding going? Um, obviously I assume you mean horse riding. Um, it's going pretty good. Um, I, a few people asked me, did I manage to you know, find somewhere to train. And I have, I currently train at the riding school that was like the second one that I went to, if you remember the original conversation that we had about horse riding. Um, so I've been going there and I've, I've been doing all right. And I was worried actually when I went on holiday that I would come back and like, not that I'd forgotten everything, but just that I would be worse. And I was so much better. It's not even funny. Actually about that on holiday, I did quite a lot of trips to the gym because I was on an all-inclusive complex and they had a gym there. So I thought, you know what, let's make use of this. So every single day when I was on holiday, I went to the gym for an hour on the morning before, you know, I'd have my breakfast and do the rest. And honestly, that's done, it's done wonders. Um, there was a few reasons why I wanted to go to the gym, the obvious reasons, I suppose. But also another thing that happened uh, shortly before I went on holiday I went to see a, I actually don't know what you call them. So not necessarily a physiotherapist, not necessarily a chiropractor. I can't remember the name of the specialist that I went to see, but I went to see someone about my back because if you remember, literally since I've started this channel, I've had back problems. Like I think really early into 2019, 
I did a video and I think I, I think it was alocasia care or something. And that week I'd just been really stiff. I'd actually been off work. I was on painkillers. It was really bad. And basically my back's never been the same since then. I think I, not long after I quit my job, I remember doing a video where I had like a, a heat pack around my neck. I think I was repotting in my flat or something. Um, and I was like, yo, my back and neck's hurting. So I've got, you know, a heat pack on, please ignore it. I've honestly had problems on and off with my back. Um, riding didn't help at the beginning. It basically set the pain receptors off in my back like a Christmas tree. And I thought, you know what? It's not getting better. It's really, it's, it's bad. It's, it's not good. Um, it's healed up. Um, a lot of that, I think, was just horse riding kind of trauma of sort of doing it wrong. I went to some shit places when I did some of my like introductory lessons with other schools. And basically, even though I wasn't ready to, to do, do things like canter, they made me do it anyway, which is fine. But the, as a result, I don't think I was landing properly on my back and I, I basically made it worse. So I went to see a guy about a back, a back guy. And uh, honestly, we went through the, you know, the initial exam or whatever. Uh, he got me to do loads of things. And then he got me to kind of put my hands down and sort of bend over like this. So he could like look up my spine and as soon as I did it, he was like, oh, oh, uh, stay there. I'll be back in just a minute. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, oh, like that typical thing that doctors do. And you're like, what the fuck is wrong with me? So he came back five minutes later with a diagram, a diagram, sorry, like a, a, a 3D model, you know, like a biology model of a spine. And he basically said, this is your spine. And he took the model and he did that to it. He twisted it and he bent it. So I learned that day, um, I actually have a spine disease called scoliosis, I think it is known. Now, I haven't done too much Googling on it because the, the guy actually told me not to. Um, I don't know if that means it's bad or because my case is mild because he did say yours is quite mild. But I have something called scoliosis, which is a bit shit. I'm not going to lie. Basically, my spine, like everyone's spine up their back is usually like this, right? Mine is not. Mine kind of, I, I mean, I can't do it with my arm, but it's its probably a bit more like that. It's not quite that severe. And um, you could notice, you could like miss it with an untrained eye. But basically, my spine does that. It curves. And as a result, loads of shit is, uh, you know, it hurts me and it irritates me and it's problematic for me. Whereas for a normal person, it probably isn't. Um, I'm really pleased to found that out though, because I've already been given exercises to do and things like that to basically strengthen the muscles. It's never going to go away. It's not something you can cure from what I know anyway, but it is something you can kind of manage. And basically I have to do loads of exercises like rowing is a good exercise. So I was doing that a lot on holiday and you can kind of even out your spine and just kind of like pull it back a little bit and sort of get it set into a little bit of a better position. Um, but honestly, I, I was noticing when I was on the rowing machine on holiday, when I'd go to grab the, the, the handle of the rower and pull it, this hand here would contact the, you know, the machine quicker and the weight would transfer immediately into this before this hand. And when I was at this appointment, the guy said, your right shoulder comes forward more than it should. And it's due to this twisting. So what I have been doing is I've been doing rowing to pull it back into shape and it's definitely helped. And I, I can't even sit here and say that I did a lot of rowing and I maybe did. I think I could only do five minutes a day because I just haven't used those muscles and it was really difficult for me. But the small amount of rowing that I have done has helped dramatically. Now, not only that, but along with a few other exercises for my core and stuff like that, I've been able to just really exercise my back and core. And as a result, when I go back on a horse after being not on one for two weeks, it was awesome, guys. Like the difference it made to my strength, my balance, everything was better. I stopped gripping the saddle with my knees as much. Um, it, it just felt so much better. I could do 30 minutes and not even be tired. Like it, something just clicked. And I think a lot of it was core strength. Um, so I'm going to continue doing those exercises, both one for horse riding to be the best rider I can be, two for general health, and three, obviously, you know, to make sure that I strengthen my back because, you know, I have this, well, disease, I guess you could say, because it is. Um, so that's basically the tea on that. That's kind of all in one go, kind of horse riding, you know, my back and holiday all in one, really. They're all kind of interconnected. 
which I don't necessarily think they should have been, but they are. So yeah, I had a great holiday, did bits of work, got fit a little bit, and it's had a fantastic impact on my riding. The only problem I'm having with my riding actually is not the riding itself. It's the amount of times I'm able to go. Like at the minute, I can only do one lesson a week, and that's only a 30-minute lesson. Um, but I, I cannot find anywhere around that has slots available for lessons. It's ridiculous. There's just nowhere with space. So ideally, I would like to do two lessons a week, easily two lessons a week, or an, or an hour a week, or two hours a week, or whatever. But I can't actually seem to find anywhere that will let me do it, not because of any other reason other than there's just no slots. So I'm kind of frustrated, um, but of course I'm loving riding and, and everything else. So good update, just that's probably the only negative I think in that update is just that I want to ride more. I'm not doing it enough. I want to be able to do it more. It makes me happy. Um, so I'm going to see once again, I'm going to open up the field again and see if I can find basically, you know, like another place that might take me um, and see if I can do an extra lesson a week because I think that would really help. And it, I feel like I could improve so much more efficiently if I just did more lessons, because it's not a case of me not knowing this stuff. It's a case of me being so rusty because I haven't done it since I was a kid. So I, I know the stuff, if you know what I mean. Most of this is just, it's muscles more than anything. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm hoping to genuinely do some more lessons, basically. Oh, I had some like slightly more quick fire ones, but I'll do this one first because it slightly relates to holiday. So um, someone asked me basically what are some podcasts or books or whatever that you read recently that you enjoyed or whatever. Now, I haven't been able to read very much, but on holiday, I read a full book and I've never been prouder. So that was awesome. I picked the book that it was on my Goodreads list for ages. Obviously, needless to say, I've never got around to doing it but I picked a cracking time of year to do it. And I read a book called The Pilo Family Circus. Um, you will find it, Google it, it's on Goodreads, everything else. I think it's one of two books, and I, I'm, I could be wrong about this, but I think the second book came out like 10 years after the first one. So the first one is written so that it was kind of left open for another book, but you could tell that it wasn't, you know, it didn't need to be another book sort of thing. I haven't read the second book, so I can't comment on it, but that's the book I read. Um, it is Halloween-y, so I'm going to talk about it very briefly just in case anyone wants something to read for Halloween that is not your typical, you know, book that everyone recommends. Because prior to reading this book, I actually looked at YouTube videos on holiday of, you know, good good fall books to read or good Halloween books to read or, or just spooky books to read, basically. Um, and I, I couldn't find anything, guys. Everyone was recommending the same stuff. And I didn't want to read any of it. And I, I just found it really samey. So I thought, you know what? That's been on my reading list for ages. I'll just read that. Why not? So I bought it on my Kindle while I was on holiday and I read it. And the book is essentially about a guy that is called Jamie, I do believe. And he has a run in with some, with three, two to three clowns basically on a dark night on the way home. And I'll try not to spoil any of this. So this will be without spoiler, but essentially one of these clowns drops a really mysterious pouch of something, like a little velvet baggie of something. And he goes and picks it up and he takes it home. He doesn't think anything of it. The clowns find this out because this is a bit of a supernatural story, by the way. The clowns basically find this out and they basically track him down and they threaten him, and they threaten him in a in a really performative way, shall we say. If you've read the book, then you'll know what I'm talking about. Um, they basically give him an ultimatum, they write him a note, they leave it in his room, the trash in his room, they leave him a note, and they're basically like, yo, you've got, I can't remember how many days it was, was it three days to um, pass your audition to join us as clowns in the circus. Obviously, I won't go into any detail at all, but he, he passes that audition, and he ends up at this circus, but the circus is not what it seems. It's not a circus that is kind of on this earth. It's almost like another dimension type scenario. And the characters are really quite wild. Um, there is an overarching kind of law within it and everything else. And it's about his time at the circus and he doesn't really want to be there. He only passed the audition because the alternative appeared to be death if he didn't pass. 
Um, so it's all about his time there, the characters he meets, the overall larger plot, which I'm not going to go over. It's quite cool. Um, it's basically, if, if you want it in a few words, it's a book about psychotic clowns. So if that seems like something for you, then I really urge you to read it. And tell me what you thought, without spoilers, down below if you have read this. But I really enjoyed it. It was like nothing else I've ever read, to be honest. It was really different. I've never read anything the same as that. I would consider reading the second book, but I'm not in any rush. If you do read it, let me know what you think. But you'll see what I mean, I think, if you read it. It's not something you necessarily have to read the second one of. But never say never, I might read it at some point. I've just got some other books on my reading list, actually, that I need to read. When I get around to it, that is. So yeah, that's basically the one thing that I have done recently in terms of books or podcasts that I would like to tell you about. Podcasts, I'm still trying to look for podcasts that are like the Magnus Archives or like the No Sleep podcast. And I've looked at all of the kind of top 10 lists on Google of like all the different podcasts are the same, like some like Welcome to the Night Vale, um, Pseudopod, uh, The Black Tapes. Like there's, there's a big list of them. And I've tried loads of different ones and I'm not liking any of them. So for the minute, I don't really have a podcast, but I'm trying to find them. Um, it's just not easy. It's just not easy. Okay, we've got some, a couple of, um, more quick fire questions, I would say. The first one someone asked me was, what is the most money you have ever spent on a houseplant? And I don't know. I actually don't know what people would guess that I'd actually spent on a house plan, I'm not really sure. Um, but let me tell you, the most money I've ever spent on a house plant was in the region of, not exact money, $40,000. Um, that's US dollars, by the way. Uh, yeah, that wasn't fun. Um, it didn't feel good. Um, that I had to question my sanity quite a lot in doing that. I'm not going to say what it is just so that, you know, at the risk of not inflating the value on on stuff because I, th I believe I've bought plants like these before they've kind of come into play a little bit and I feel like the value I've paid is higher than what they could be who knows so I don't want to say what the plant is but 40,000 is the amount roundabout not you know not exactly but roundabout um the amount I've paid for a plant uh, ouch, yeah. This is why in a video a while ago, guys, people were like, oh my god, what's your opinion on the £10,000 Monstera that sold and such and such? And it's like, I can't really have an opinion when I'm spending that much. Do you know what I mean? Um, so that's why I don't have an opinion. And there's not a lot of point in having an opinion. Um, when you buy at this level, it's like it's done as a business asset. So it's it's not it's not like buying a plant for yourself. It's not like a personal purchase. Obviously not. What the hell? There's so many things I'd rather have than that if it was a personal purchase, believe me. Uh, namely, a horse is one of them. Um, so I would never spend that on a personal purchase. They say it's like a business thing. And to be honest, every purchase I make these days, it's not for me plant-wise. It's for the business. Maybe I might buy a one-off, um, but you could argue it's still for the business. It's not really for me. Um, I, I feel like I have enough, don't you? generally. Um, but yeah, that's the most I've ever spent on a plant. And there was another question sort of similar. What was it? A plant that you want to have but can't hope to find. So I, I, if, if this was filmed a week earlier, I might have been able to give you an answer. But I think I found it. And I might be buying it. So again, I don't really want to say what that is. But it's a plant that, honestly, I wanted to have it. And I thought, you know what, I'll get my hands on it in like a few years when it becomes available. But I never thought I would get it this year, let alone next year or the year after. Do you know what I'm saying? I thought this was a long way off. But I've managed to get one. And I'm really quite excited about it. Um, you will meet it at some point. Give me a few weeks. Um, plus, it hasn't even arrived yet, by the way. Um, I've only paid for it, so... Give me a few weeks and I promise you, you will, you will see that. But it is a unicorn. I have a couple of unicorns, actually, that I will unveil in a few weeks. I'm just letting them get acclimated and stuff like that. But you will see them, I promise. This will not be cryptic in a few weeks. Um, I just want to give it some time to make sure I get the plant and, you know, nothing falls through, nothing goes wrong. Otherwise, that just makes me sound a bit weird saying I've got something when I haven't. So I will be doing that, don't worry. But, yeah, I think I might have found the plant that I was kind of after. Obviously, there's a few that I had on my wish list, but some of the plants I was after, they weren't even on my wish list. They would have gone on 
when I do my wish list this Christmas time, they would have gone on, don't, don't get me wrong, but I think I've managed to find it before I've even had the chance to update my list. So I'm really excited. And if you can hear anything right now, which you might not be able to, that's a siren kicking off. So this, this trunk is way too squidgy. I think this could be rotting, guys. I'm going to do something. I'm going to pull this. I'm going to get rid of a lot of this trunk because I feel like there we go. That can stay as a trunk. You won't be able to see it, but it's not very healthy, so I'm going to leave that. I'm going to pull that off for its own safety so I don't kill that plant. Right, let's keep going. As I say, I'm not going to keep you too long today because I have a lot to do. A lot to do. What else have we got? I can't view it because... oh. My phone keeps going off. It's very irritating. Oh, okay, I've got two good ones left and I will make sure we get through these topics because I think they, they, they're sort of important and I would like to speak on them. So, so the first one I have to talk about, a lot of people ask me all the time and I mean all the time. I get it on Instagram posts. I get it on every video. I get it um, sometimes emailed to me. Uh, I, I get this a lot and I have kind of answered it before, but I appreciate not everyone watches these videos, right? I totally get that. So... The number one thing I'm asked all the time, it's two questions. Uh, one is, what are your grow lights on your shelves? And two is, what is your pest control? Now then, the reason I don't talk about them, you, you haven't missed it really in terms of me saying what it is because I never have. And there's some very transparent reasons I can tell you why that is. So let's start with the grow lights. The lights you will see around the shop on the shelves behind me are not really domestic lights. It's not something that I would ever recommend to put in your homes. They're not waterproof. It's not ideal. I would not recommend those lights. So the last thing I'm going to do, because they're not technically super, super safe, is the last thing I'm going to do is recommend them to you. Um, not only that, but I don't think you can buy them unless you're buying them by the hundreds. So I, I really, I'm not going to recommend them. Um, I guess grow lights is like a separate video, right? You could say. So I'm not going to talk about them for that reason. And that is the only reason. I, I do not recommend them. I will not have people put them in their homes. I don't suggest it. You know, I would like to have different lights in the shop. Yes, they work, but they're not great. So I'm not going to recommend them to you. Now, the other thing, I was talking to my friend about this the other day, actually. We we're having a bit of a laugh. But um, I'll tell you why we're having a laugh in a minute. So uh, the other question people ask me, of course, is the pest control. Now, the reason I don't talk about my pest control, guys, is because it's commercial. And trust me when I tell you, you cannot have this shit in your house. You will kill everything and everyone on board. It is not safe to have in your house. Um, literally, you cannot buy it, I don't think, without a commercial license for one. So that's one reason. Um, for example, uh, some of my pesticide is actually a neurotoxin. So it will systemically kill any, if anything. And it's, it's fucking hardcore. Let me, let me tell you. I use a combination of some systemic stuff that's fed to the plant so that if anything munches on it, it dies. I have some, some other neurotoxin stuff and I have some really strong bug bombs that are not safe at all because half the time when I set them off here, and I'll, I'll tell you how I do it anyway, but half the time when I set them off here, they set on fire and they need extinguished. They are not safe for your home. So please forgive me for not mentioning that. Um, so yeah, so what I do with bug bombs is I set them off and I have to leave this place for at least 24 hours. And when I get back, the whole place needs aired out, which is good anyway for air exchange for the plants, of course, good fresh air, but also to get that out of the air because it is so bad. So I set off, I think this place is big enough for two to three bombs. And I set them off. It's like a massive cloud of smoke. And then the fans will circulate it through the whole place. My studio gets covered. The wall gets covered. All of this gets touched. And basically, it kills most things with legs. It kills it dead. And it doesn't really matter how big it is. It's, it's, it's fucking hardcore, right? Um, I know a few people have asked me, yo, why don't you just use natural pest control? And I have answered that one before. And basically the reason for that is that my customer base, just going to be honest, they, they don't want that. I know they don't want that. If I did natural pest control, i.e. an insect that eats the bad insect, 
I think we all know fine well that there will be a ton of people all over the internet saying that I send out my plants with pests and they won't know the difference. Now I can put promotional material in, you know, like a leaflet in the box explaining that it's a form of pest control, but people, a lot of people just don't like bugs anyway. And my customer base, I don't think generally speaking, they're the kind of people that want that. So I like to do it this way. Um, it's good for me anyway, because I'm afraid of certain insects anyway. So it's kind of good for that. It's great pest control for the living wall because obviously, uh, how can you do that? Now the wall gets sprayed with stuff as well. It gets sprayed with like antifungal, all that sort of stuff. So it gets sprayed anyway. But in addition to that, it really benefits from the bug bombs. And my camera cut out again. I need to watch how long this is recording for because I miss it and it goes off and I don't know what you haven't heard me say. But essentially, to recap, in case it has gone off, I basically just spoke about the fact that I would not give away a commercial secret to another shop because why should I? I've worked years to basically develop that. And B, you guys, you can't, you can't use this in your house. Trust me, you don't want, you don't want. It will kill everything. It'll probably make your children very ill as well. I'm not recommending that. I'm not having that on my head just because someone wants to try it. So for that reason, I will, I will literally never tell you what my pest control is. And I do feel really for you guys, because honestly, oh, two seconds, I've got moss on me now. I've probably got moss on my face. We'll just have to leave it there. Um, <laughs> I feel you because I have the same problem at home. I do, honestly. I find pest control at home really difficult because I'm using all the methods that you guys have to use. And it sucks because the methods aren't that great, are they? Yes, they kind of work, but it, it is work. You know, whether, whereas over here, it's, it's not work and things are so aggressive when you come to commercial grade stuff, because obviously a lot of nurseries do have this shit like this, well, not like exactly this, but you know, everything's close together and you couldn't possibly manually go around. And this is a small place compared to a nursery. Can you imagine what a nursery would have to do for pest control? Um, I, I mean, in Thailand, they've got different products because a lot of nurseries in Thailand, for example, they're out in the open air. So pests there probably have to be dealt with even differently. And I, I believe it's done through like misters and just very aggressive spray and stuff like that. I'm not sure how it's done. Um, that's me guessing. But yeah, that's why I won't talk about it. There's no shady reason other than, yeah, of course, I'm not going to give away a commercial secret. But it is just that it is commercial. So that's the only reason why. Um, if you ever, you know, if you ever see some one of my videos asking me about pest control, feel free to answer it for me if you like. Um, just, you know, that it's commercial, you can't use it. And obviously, I'm not going to tell a shop. I'm sorry, I don't care what people think of me. I'm not going to tell a shop. So, yeah, that's that. I feel like it's getting super dark in here. My phone's gone off again. I've just got juice all over it. Let's have a look. Uh, the other topic was... <coughs> oh, okay. So, <coughs> the last topic I want to discuss actually... Just a question that I get asked from time to time. It's never been really asked often enough for, to warrant like a super quick answer and a super in-depth thing. But as I'm not keeping you quite as long today, I thought I'd tell you about it. So I get asked a lot why I don't take sponsorships. Um, I actually don't know how much other plant YouTubers do take sponsorships because I, I don't necessarily watch um, houseplant content on YouTube. I don't have the time, guys. I don't. Um, so I don't really know to what extent sponsorships occur so sorry if that's getting super noisy um it's it's rain hopefully you don't hear what i'm even talking about right now yeah i don't know to what extent sponsorships are utilized in the community but honestly guys it's not that i won't take them and this is the weird thing i don't really get offered them i do get offered sponsorships that's a lie i do get offered sponsorships but they're either so left field or they're just, they're, they're done under conditions that I find really distasteful. And that is something I want to talk about. So I get offered sponsorships. Usually the ones, if, if any small YouTubers are watching, you know exactly what I'm probably about to talk about. The shitty grow light sponsorships. They're everywhere, right? They're everywhere. And I'm not knocking anyone that's done one. Honestly, we've all done things once we've all tried it. Do you know what I'm saying? And I'm not trying to brand every grow light company as being aggressive and fucking nasty, but a lot of them seem to be. Okay, someone had to say it. 
someone had to say it. So the amount of times, oh, the amount of times that I've seen companies say, we're going to send you this $150 grow light and you're going to do 11 fucking videos about this light and they're going to be on these dates and they're going to say these things. And it's like, who the fuck do you think we are? And I'm saying that as like we as in YouTubers, right? Who the fuck do you think we are? Now, this is kind of a message to smaller YouTubers. And honestly, I've thought about talking about this for a while and I'm happy to talk about it more. Um, if any YouTubers want to do any kind of, how would you say, like a, a Skype session or something talking about like stuff like this, um, I'm more than happy to. I will probably let Pam organize that um, or, or something like that. But if, if anybody ever wants to kind of share the load and, and weigh in on this kind of stuff, then feel free. We will organize it. It's like, who the fuck do you think you're talking to? I don't care how many subscribers you've got, right? And sorry, sorry guys, I'm talking to plan YouTubers at the minute, right? It doesn't have to be a plan YouTuber, but I will explain this in a bit and it seems to work differently if it's not plans. I'll get onto that in a minute. So I don't actually care how many subscribers you have. You could have 500, you could have 5,000, you could have 50,000. It doesn't really matter. Because the thing that these grow light companies know is they know a few things and they think a few things, but you are sat, however small the pool is, you are sat on a absolutely streamlined target market for that um, company. And let me tell you something. And a lot of people will know this, but I'm going to reiterate it for anybody that might not know this. Sorry, I am absolutely covered. This is how it is today. So when you have a product that might retail for a hundred pounds, right? I'm talking about like built products here. So for EJ grow light, right? Retails for a hundred pounds. Now this is the classic thing as it is with things like iPhones. It doesn't stop at iPhones. It stops. Well, it doesn't stop. It, it's everything. So you can have a light that costs a hundred pounds retail and the retailer will tell you that. And that's true. It probably does retail for a hundred pounds, but let me tell you the cost price is probably 10 pounds or less. Um, not with everything. No, of course not. But I tell you now, markups margins are usually at least 30% minimum. It's normally about 60% to be honest. That's normally a reasonable margin. I think for even the retailer to sell something at. So a lot of times when you buy wholesale goods, a value of an item to buy in might be £10 a unit. You're probably going to sell them on at, say, £50 a unit or something like that. That's just how it's done. That's how the world works. Now, the problem with that is you are basically entering into an agreement where, one, you have to give up how, how many hours of your time, guys, to produce a YouTube video on, on anything. Let's be honest. I know a lot of people seem to think that it's just like turning a camera on, turning it off, uploading it, done. Anyone that's even tried to do YouTube or knows someone that does YouTube, it is not like that. I'm not going to go into it because I don't need to. Um, it's just not how it is. But imagine how many hours of your week you would have to give up to do a video, just one video on a grow light. And if you're a small YouTuber, that, that time is at great cost because that's the time where you're trying to grow your channel. You're trying to do the content people really want. And I think a lot of small YouTubers feel like sponsorships are a risk. I think sometimes... I think it's okay if you're getting stuff free and that's part of the trap that they get you in. But the amount of time you put in to do one of these videos for one of these companies and they, they don't just expect that. They expect a whole lot more because I've seen the emails from other YouTubers, emails I've got and everything else. Um, what they expect from you for a light that literally is 10 pounds is quite cheeky. Now, this doesn't work this way on the rest of YouTube, mostly, from what I can tell. And I will share with you a little nugget. So, I mean, on my Instagram, I've actually had to block most grow light companies because they're so aggressive, they wouldn't leave me alone. And I had to send the messages going, do not contact me again. I find your sales tactics and everything else very aggressive because they were. Um, and they would, they would stop and then they would, someone else would contact me from the same company or they would email me or whatever. I've, I've had to block them. But what I do know from absolute personal experience is my other channel, Kaylee Allen Unfiltered, I get deals through there. Honestly, daily, I get offers for sponsorships and stuff like that. And again, not knocking anyone that takes them. It's totally up to you. Me personally, my stance on it is I will do one if it fits the channel. I'm really not um, 
not open to that. I'd have to like the product because I won't lie to people. So it has to be a product that I like. Um, but the amount of sponsorships I get offered on my second channel and the etiquette that people have compared to what us plant YouTubers get is night and day. So on my other channel, I get offered, obviously, the product sent to me. I get offered a rate for my video. Like, what is your rate? What, what are your costs? What are your, what's your fee for even doing a video? Even if that is a video giving an honest opinion on a product where you're not even paid to say a certain thing, you just paid to give your opinion, you are sent the product and you are literally given a fee to do so and you you select the fee, you can negotiate over it, they can decline, you can decline, whatever, that's what it is. And the etiquette I have been approached with on my second channel is flawless. I honestly, I can't fault it. The companies that are coming out to me, they, they know how it goes, they're very respectful, they ask you what the rates are, they're very kind if you know you give them a rate that's too high or anything like that, they're very, very nice. And I, I love them already. I've only worked with one. I'm going to be working with a couple more soon. I'm kind of planning it now on the second channel that is. Uh, but the etiquette is just, it's there. Now, I don't know what the fuck is going on with the plant community, but there is less than zero etiquette for the same thing. And I don't really understand why. Because the job is no different. The backdrop is just different. And the, the, the content is different. That's it. It's, it's still the same thing. Now, yes, subscribe account in my case is different. But could you explain to me why people are approaching me in a field that is not plants and I have less subscribers? They're approaching me in a kinder way with more respect and more to offer than what anyone has ever done on this channel. And this channel is obviously significantly larger. Explain that to me. And I'm sorry, but grow like companies, you are the worst. You are the worst. I've had a lot of bad shit in my time. Grow like companies are the worst. Um, I'm not trying to target grow like companies specifically, but they are honestly the carbon example that I think a lot of YouTubers would pluck out. Um, they also, uh, companies, this is not grow like companies, but just companies anyway that approach you to review an Amazon product. They actually make you purchase the product and then they will say that they give you the money back afterwards and they will send you an affiliate link that they get money from if you buy the product and then they will reimburse you. Now, from what I hear, they do reimburse you, but the thing is, they've already made commission off the sale of you buying the item. And when you do leave the review on the product, it comes off as a genuine purchase because you've actually made the purchase. So they're only doing it to boost their own sales. Trust me, you get fuck all. You get a video for that week and they get everything. I don't think it's fair when all of you guys are literally providing a streamlined demographic for these people that before YouTubers, think about this, guys, before YouTubers was not really possible for these companies. And these companies are breaking into the houseplant market more so than the commercial market. Take, for example, grow lights. They're breaking into this market and they know fine well that they need you. So from me to you, this has got nothing to do with me. Uh, my advice is to hold strong, give them rates. And if they don't like it, they can shove it because you are really important to them. They just don't seem to want to make you feel like it. And I don't know why. I don't know why it's okay to make anybody do 10 or 11 videos about a product that you're giving away for virtually free. That's hours and hours and hours and hours and hours of someone's time. I don't know why people think that is for free. I really don't. Sorry, that was a huge rant. Uh, it wasn't supposed to be. I actually hope that's kind of helpful to, to anyone watching. Um, my opinion on sponsorships, to make that absolutely clear, whether it's grow lights, it doesn't fucking matter whether it's shampoo, grow lights, uh, I don't know, magazines, what else do people sponsor, uh, perfume, clothes, it doesn't matter what it is. My stance on it is go for it, get the coin, you're working for it, you are providing a service to the, the you know, the company that wants that from you. Um, my advice is obviously to pick something that you think your audience is interested in if you're concerned about it. Um, be transparent with your audience about it. But as for me personally, I would absolutely take a sponsorship. But nothing has come through the door where I feel valued enough in my time because it's precious to me or I feel comfortable enough with what has been offered. Like I've had some quite big brands actually approach me. They're just starting to on this channel because I'm guessing I'm tipping into like a, a bracket where businesses deem it to be a, a good level you could say to advertise to i'm getting some well-known brands contact me but half the time they're clothing brands 
And I've had to check with them, you know, which channel are you referring to that you want the sponsorship for? And they always say this one. And I'm like, well, no, I'm not going to do it. I could have, but I'm not going to do it because it's not a right fit. And I, I want to keep as true to myself as I can. So I would take them. I have literally no problem with anybody taking them at all. I think you should. Why, why the fuck not? You're working like everyone else. You should get paid, right? Um, but some of you need to really, really revise your etiquette. And I think if all of the YouTubers took a stance on this, um, no matter how big or small you are, I think we could change that quite quickly. Um, and I know a lot of YouTubers have. I'm not sure how vocal y'all have been about this because I haven't necessarily seen the videos. I'm sure you have been. But it is a problem that a lot of YouTubers get. Um, I haven't been offered a sponsorship on this channel for a long time that is that is relevant anyway, that is plenty. Um, nine times out of ten, and though it's it's a grow light and it's, you know, do six videos and you get this amazing grow light valued at, valued at a real value of like ten dollars. Um, so obviously I'm not going to do that. It's not worth my time. Um, but I'm not against it at all. I just think that it's got to be right and I've got to be treated correctly because I wouldn't do the company dirty. So why would they do me dirty? And I think that's it for today because I could probably go on about that forever. And I can actually tell it's getting really dark. Does it look like it on camera? No, it looks great. Of course it does. <laughs> it's getting really, really dark and it's getting quite noisy. And I actually have to go and edit. Well, what you will see now is last week's video um, to get it out for my members on time. So I'm going to love you and leave you. This was a little bit shorter than usual. A little bit short and sweet. It's quite nice. And it was, I guess, different topics. But if you have any other topics that you'd like me to discuss in the future, I can't get my words out then please leave them in the comments. Thank you very much for watching this video. Again, leave any comment that you want about anything I've said. It's cool. And I will see you, I guess, next week where I think I have quite a fun video for you. So yeah, I've just filmed it before this. So stay tuned for that. Hint, it's gnarly stuff for Halloween. Thank you very much, guys. Please like this video if you liked it. And if you want to see any of my content, then please feel free to subscribe. That's it. And I will see you next week. Bye.